the city of power. You have to be prepared to be a little bit aggressive, but also be prepared to uh, bat your eyelashes when you need to to get things done. I'm Amir Paivar, and this is the story of the city of London. The City of London, or the Square Mile as it is known, is the oldest part of London and has been a global financial centre for centuries. But the city stands accused of helping create the global financial crisis through a combination of greed and reckless profit making. I want to find out more about this place and where it might be going in the future. Today, I'm heading to the highly respected London Metal Exchange, the world's centre for trading non-precious metals. Over the last decade, more than $40 trillion worth of trading has taken place here. The trading floor at the London Metal Exchange is very unique. It is the last open outcry trading floor in Europe. That means that here we have people using hand signals in order to transact business. So you will often hear people calling out, I'll buy at 100, I'll sell at 100. How will they decide to sell or to buy? They will be looking for any type of data that could make the price go up and the price go down. That means that if they spot an opportunity to either offset risk by hedging or take on risk by speculative investment, they will do that. They will take, uh, they will take trades on behalf of their clients, but also they will invest what's known as um, proprietary money. Uh, so they'll essentially be betting, or I uh, don't want to use that word. Uh, <laughs> but joking aside, Gambling and greedy short-term money-making is exactly what some have accused the players in the city of getting involved in. It's a world Grant Anderson knows well. He was once a city boy himself, until he left and wrote a best-selling expose of the Square Mile's sharp practices. The ideal city boy is ruthless, he's greedy, he is hyper-competitive. It's all about winning and making that deal. If you've got a trading floor that is dominated by young testosterone fueled males, they're going to tend to take bigger gambles, riskier gambles, than the average person on the street. So if anything, it just creates a quite volatile, unstable system full of booms and busts. But was it always like this? I decided to meet an old-timer who has seen it all before. He told me that the city of 40 years ago was a very different place. It was a world apart. Uh, not only were half the buildings not here, um, but in terms of the attitude and behaviour. It depended on your class, you know, which public school, which you went to, or university, or obviously either Cambridge or Oxford, as a matter of which college, or potentially, if you weren't quite as bright, which, you, which regiment in the army you went to. 25 at five, and the bias. And then, of course, it was institutionally racist. It was whites only. Uh, and, of course, women. What women? You turn if you want to. This gentleman's club started to break down in the 1980s, when Margaret Thatcher was Britain's prime minister. The ladies not for turning. Large-scale computerization and market deregulation occurred in a process nicknamed the Big Bang. New technology like the mobile phone became status symbols and the city became more of a meritocracy where anyone could make money regardless of their social background or their haircut. But this was the Thatcher era. And, of course, then was greed good? Well, greed was certainly then more acceptable. And so you went from almost one extreme to the other extreme within a few years, as you saw people were looking to try and earn huge bonuses on the basis of trading without necessarily having necessarily all the respect 
for the money they were looking after. And those old phrases which is, it's a privilege to look after clowns' money, not a right. The difference between the city boy now and the stockbroker of 40 years ago is then it was a little bit gauche to talk about money. Then it was a sort of a more refined world. Now it's much more in your face and blatant. It's about making money as quickly as possible. If we go out drinking late into the night, maybe people take cocaine, people um, partying hard, taking clients to strip joints, prostitutes. It's a less refined, it's a less civilized world. It's, it's more blatant about what it's about. Very male. You go to most of the pubs here, 80% men. It certainly sounds like a macho man's world. So what is it like for women working here? I went to meet Sarah Flynn, a manager at a leading communications company. It's challenging. It is very much a man, male-dominated environment. Um, you have to be sure of what you're saying and what you're doing in order to survive. Very often I'm the only woman in a meeting, um, or one of very few, um, and you just have to be prepared to be a little bit aggressive sometimes to, to get what you want done and, and to get things moving. Is negotiating male egos like walking through a minefield? Yes, negotiating male egos is like walking through a minefield. Especially with some of the, the older gentlemen that I have to deal with who come from very traditional backgrounds and are used to dealing with, with men all the time um, who don't like being put straight by a woman, especially potentially not a younger woman. You have to know how to approach the situation, use your influence and persuasion skills to get them to see your point of view um, and occasionally bat your eyelids to get stuff done as well. What kind of roles or jobs do women have in the city? Are they in senior positions? I'm in a management role, um, but the majority of people that I deal with, my customers at sort of board level, CTO, CIO level, management, all tend to be men. I don't deal with many other women at the same level that I am. Um, a lot of women in the city, I think, take more traditional female roles, administrative, secretarial, that kind of thing. So the city remains a largely male-dominated environment, concerned with money-making above all else. Not that this is anything new. For centuries, the money men have seen themselves not only as a world apart from other centres of power, but actually above them all. London is made up of different places, and there are two major centres, Westminster and the City of London. And Westminster is always associated with the court, with the king, and the city has always been associated with commerce and trade. So is the City of London a breakaway district which balanced power in the old times with, with Westminster? The real power usually rested with the merchants. They were the people who were very, very powerful. And they formed a sort of an, a, an alliance with the king. When the king needed money to fight wars, he would come to the city and they would lend him money. So they were in a very, very powerful place and that's why traditions have built up where the city is almost apart from the rest of the country. It has its own rules and regulations. And this separation is physical too. If you go to the borders of the city of London, you'll see that they are all guarded by some fearsome creatures. The dragon behind me is the symbol of the city of London and it guards its borderland. On my right hand side is Westminster and on my left the city begins. It is at this very spot, at Temple Bar, where the Queen herself has to stop and ask permission from the city's authorities before she can enter. And it's not just these symbols of the city's power that have remained a constant for centuries. So have the streets themselves. This map is based on a 400-year-old design. None of the bridges you see here existed back then. But the city itself, the financial district, is here. Now, incredibly, the names and the layout of the streets of Square Mile haven't changed over four centuries. I'm meeting up with Justin Stewart again to get an insider's perspective on the city's old places. So, Justin, looking at this map, this very old map, 
it seems the layout of this square hasn't really changed, has it? No, when you consider after the odd fire and one or two bombings from various peoples, it's actually in remarkably the same sort of style. When you think here, here's the Bank of England, um, and so that's, that would be the central bank. That's our central bank. With lots of gold underneath? Yeah, but we don't own any of it anymore, sadly. But that's where they make the decision on interest rates, and that was actually established then uh, uh, years ago, and it's the sort of the central bank, but also a bank in its own right. Oh, um, and then over here, we've got the Royal Exchange, and okay. the Royal Exchange has had a checkered history. It was uh, stock exchange only for a short while. It was the futures market, the life market it was called. What is it now then? Now it's a rather swanky shopping centre. So eventually commercialism takes over. Next, we headed to a centuries old market. It was still operating today. Justin, where are we now? Uh, this is Leaden Hall Market, on okay. the site of the old Leaden Hall, which is marked on the map here. But this is a sort of Victorian creation, but it was a market, and a market which was primarily meat, but some fruit and veg. But there's, today there's still there are butchers here, cheesemakers here, and so you can actually see proper commerce going on here, as opposed to just people sitting at their keyboards the entire time. Oh. Our next destination was an old pub in the heart of the historic banking area. But this wasn't just any old bar. Right, what are you going to have? A glass of water. That'll do. Just saying, our pub is a favourite destination for traders. But not during the day. <laughs> Those days are long gone. Now it's in the evening. But this isn't an ordinary pub. Uh, this is actually one of the old coffee houses. And the coffee houses are important. This is actually Pasca Rosé's coffee house. It was founded well, 1650, 1652, something like that. Uh, a gentleman of Greek origin who was responsible for a lot of trade into, uh, into the Levant, into Turkey, into the Middle East. And these houses were used where, where you could actually have a, spend a penny for the day, sit here drinking coffee, and you would actually do your transactions, do your business. If you like, it was a sort of very early version of sort of someone like Starbucks. Starbucks! Nothing's changed except the quality of the coffee. It's worse. So there were actually deals being made here alongside the city of London. This is actually where you had the first trading places. So, for instance, the Stock Exchange started in a coffee house called Jonathan's, which is just a few alleys away from here. But there were coffee shops springing up all over the place for anybody who was trading in news. So you had the first journalists here in terms of insurance, but also in terms of the stock market itself. So it was a crucial area. But the key to London's historical position as the world's foremost global financial hub was not its architecture or its coffee shops. There is one thing here that never changes. One look at London from the air and the answer is clear. It's the mighty River Thames, a constant feature flowing throughout the ages. From early times, London has always depended upon the river to bring goods in and to bring goods out. So London has um, been a great trading city right from very, very early times. In the 18th and 19th century, London becomes one of the centres of world trade. So the river is absolutely crucial to that. And we get the building of docks in the early 19th century, the world's largest docks of that period. And the most famous of all those docks is the West India Dock. And that's where Canary Wharf is sited today. I'm taking a journey down the River Thames to have a look at Canary Wharf for myself. You can feel the immense history of London on this river. In the 1960s, the Docklands started to decline as bigger facilities were built closer to the coast. And within a decade, they were derelict. But nowadays, Canary Wharf is like an island devoted to capitalism and consumerism. It came about in the 1980s when the government declared the area a special redevelopment zone. Originally, 
The glass and steel towers of Canary Wharf were conceived of as a rival to the city of London.